so today I'd like to talk to you about vendoring and import path rewriting. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, vendoring is the practice of taking dependency packages that you're using and copying all the source code into your own project's uh, VCS repository. They're pretty great doing these two things. Of course, they're not perfect, but today I just want to take a look at some of the good stuff. And let's do it in the context of the, of the tool that I'm most familiar with, which is Godep. How many of you have used Godep before? Or Okay, so maybe about a third. You know what it is. Uh, if, you, if you haven't used it before, if you're not familiar, it's, uh, it's just a, a tool to help you actually do these two things. It helps you keep track of what your dependencies are and to do the grunt work of copying source code into your project. But in case you, in case you, you haven't used it before, I just want to give a real quick uh, recap of how it started and how it got to where we are today. So it began in April of last year, and it was super basic. The idea was we're, we're building an executable here. We're writing some Go, some command that's written in Go, and we want to be able to consistently reproduce the same build. So, so what did Godep do? It, the idea is just write down a list of all the dependencies, including the Go compiler version, and the exact commit, the, the VCS commit ID of each one that we use to build and test the software in the first place as we wrote it. Sort of the point of this was that that's, that's the minimum information that we need so that later on we can use that list to recreate the same build. For example, if you're pushing your code to a continuous integration server or a build farm or or a coworker's computer or something like that. It's actually not that hard to produce this list. Um, he, he, here's uh, some couple of shell commands that this assumes that all your dependencies are using git, but, but you get the idea. It's fairly straightforward to do this. Uh, and that's, that more or less is what godep save, the godep save command originally did. It just got that list of, of commit IDs and packages and wrote it to a file. But a backup isn't a backup if you can't restore it. And just like this list that we've made is no good unless we can easily use it to reproduce the code that it describes. So, of course, this, this save command was accompanied by a wrapper for the Go tool. We called it go.go, which would take this list, fetch all the code that it, that's named there into a temporary directory, and sort of gin up a Go path that's pointing to all those packages that we just downloaded. And that sort of worked. Uh, you know, we, we just use that Go path and then it would run the Go tool. And so you'd wind up picking up all the exact right versions of all those dependencies. It sort of worked. I basically got the job done and it was certainly convenient. However, uh, it's not good enough. Remember just a minute ago, I said that the list of commit IDs is sufficient to reconstruct the build environment, but it's not. We need that plus a working and reasonably fast network to actually retrieve the source code for all those packages. Now, if you think, and, and sometimes networks fail, if you think, oh, that's no big deal, the network is reliable, well, some of my distributed systems friends would like to have words with you later on. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, uh, network reli unreliability is a problem that a distributed VCS is perfectly suited to address. So I think we should, we should use that to our advantage. And secondly, this is like a slightly more humanitarian aspect to it. It's not just us, but it's, it's our users who might be, have to be fetching all that code. And not everyone has access to a first class, high bandwidth, low latency uplink to the internet. Um, you can do your users a favor, we can do all of our users a favor by making things a little bit easier on them and making it more likely that they'll have all the code close at hand when they need it. And it's not just the network that's that's potentially a problem. Uh, on top of that, we need all those URLs where, that are listed in as, as our dependencies. We need those URLs to stick around. Sometimes the owner of a package uh, moves it to another place and there's no redirect, or sometimes people delete things entirely. And once again, like if, if you think this isn't a problem in, in practice, you, eventually you'll be unpleasantly surprised. Don't just expect people to be polite and not do this. Basically, you want to ask, like, why are you using a tool like Godap in the first place? If you don't want to have to rely on the goodwill of, of arbitrary people out there to not to break their interfaces, you also don't want to have to rely on their goodwill not to delete things in the first place. So how do we fix this? We can try to address these problems piecemeal with things like 
caching and mirroring and say, putting up a centralized code repository where people are never allowed to delete anything. And a lot of, a lot of language ecosystems uh, use approaches like these. Some people have tried to do similar things in Go. It's a valid approach. These things will help. They, they will mitigate a lot of the problems that we've just talked about, but they come at a cost. Um, not the least of which is just the, the cost of running additional infrastructure, having more moving pieces, both in the ecosystem as a whole and possibly inside your own organization. For example, if you have a local mirror or a local cache of, of Go packages. Or we can go back to the drawing board. If we want the minimal information necessary to reproduce the source code of all our dependencies, figure out what that set of minimal information really is. It turns out it's the source code. So that's the idea. And so godep save with a copy flag, godep save minus copy, was born. It does what godep has always done. It produces this list of all our dependency packages. But in addition, it copies the source code of all those dependencies into a subdirectory in our repo. Of course, it's a very old technique, and there are many implementations. Um, and this is, this is just the one that we have in Godep. Another way to think of this, if you prefer, is vendoring code is sort of like denormalization in a relational database. It's a time-space trade-off we can make once we've developed an understanding of the problem domain and we have some idea of what kinds of queries we'll be making. In our case, the problem domain is writing Go programs that depend on open source packages. And the query that we run overwhelmingly often is build this command, github.com slash foo slash bar. The list that we talked about before of the dependencies along with their commit IDs is a relation between our product, our project, and all the dependencies that it uses. So we can denormalize that relation to get better performance. So why is this a good trade-off? You don't always want to denormalize your database. Well, let's be specific. We are trading disk space to make things faster and more reliable. There are other advantages and disadvantages of vendoring, but some of which we'll, we'll mention in a minute, but this is the basic technical trade-off. Our own repo gets bigger, sometimes much bigger, and this works because disk space is cheap and speed and reliability are harder to come by. So first of all, I, I want to say I, I love how fast vendoring makes, makes builds. We're avoiding a bunch of network round trips, fetching a bunch of packages by bundling them all into one big git fetch. You know what I'm talking about if you've ever used Heroku to deploy a, a Go app. This is just one example. And compared it with just about any other language on Heroku, the difference in deployment speed is pretty striking. And a lot of it comes from the fact that all of the source code is, is always just there, um, already at hand. And the other thing is reliability. It's so good that, that you sort of stop noticing it. Um, instead of caching and mirroring and, and things like that, we have a principled solution that just guarantees we've always got the source code that we need. It's just already there. So we added this this functionality to Godep. And since then, we've made it the default behavior and in fact, removed the alternative. So as of September 22nd, Godep always includes the source code of your dependencies when we run Godep save. It's now much better, I think, at living up to its stated goal. The goal is building packages reproducibly by fixing their dependencies. I need to mention one thing briefly. Go records exact commit IDs. It, it doesn't record version strings or tags or anything like that. It doesn't try to make sense of these version, of any version strings. So it doesn't let us, it doesn't try to let you say, well, anything between version 1.3 and 1.5 is okay. Uh, trying to extract semantic meaning from version strings is just kind of a mess. But luckily it's unnecessary. Godep is meant for the application programmer, the integrator the person who's writing package main. In that role, we're the ones who run Godep save. If we care enough to use Godep in the first place, then we should take the time to choose the exact version of each dependency we use 
and to reevaluate and retest each time we want to update one of those dependencies. It's not that hard, just do it. And if we're a library maintainer, we shouldn't use GoDep at all. There are plenty of things we can do to make our users' lives better. For example, communicating clearly about what our compatibility promises are, if any. But GoDep is something only package main needs to worry about. Okay, so that's why vendoring is necessary, or at least a good idea. Now here are a couple of cool extra benefits that weren't obvious, at least they weren't obvious to me, before we started using this approach more broadly. Uh, first of all, Git. Git or any other VCS is, is time travel. That's its basic function. It lets you go back in time. But putting all of our dependency code in our own repo means that we can reproduce not just today's build, but any build from our entire history, even across updates of dependencies. It doesn't matter if some, some random package totally redesigned its interface and you updated your own code to match the new interface. We can run git bisect and test exactly the code that we had before. You don't need to run something like bundle install as part of the git bisect command to re-download packages every time it has to test a slightly different version. And the disappearing repo, oh, the disappearing repo problem that, that we just talked about a minute ago is exacerbated by this, this historical activity. The, long, the farther back in history you go, the more likely it is that things become inaccessible on the internet. And by the way, git bisect, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's a way to uh, figure out which commit of a, of a particular range of commits you're interested in by running a command automatically to test whether or not the commit is, is interesting. For example, if, if a bug has been introduced at some point in history and you don't know where, you want to test a bunch of different commits at different points in history to see whether or not each one had the bug. Git bisect will automatically do this using a binary search. It's really nice to be able to use it and not have to worry about things disappearing off the internet because they're so old. Okay, so git bisect is awesome. And patching. How many, how many people here have ever needed to make just, just one little change to a dependency package and, and urgently deploy it to production? Uh, um, and, and, but you don't want to wait until the maintainer has had a chance to review, you know, you want to send, put your, the, publish your patch, you want to publish your patch on the internet, send a pull request or, or send a patch to the maintainer and wait for them to review it and merge it into their project before you can deploy that change. Doing this with vendoring and GoDep is phenomenal. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a second, but first, how to contribute to a Go package in general. This is, this is of course, just one aspect of, of contributing, but it's not obvious. It, it feels obvious once you've done it for a while, but it was not obvious to me. I needed to have this explained. In general, here's how to do it. It doesn't matter if you're using GoDep or not, by the way, if, or if you were using vendoring or not. This is just in general. Fork the project on GitHub, or create wherever, wherever else you want to publish your changes. But then go get to install the original package path, not our fork. CD into that path, into that location where the original package import path is, and add our fork as another Git remote there. And then you can test and make all your changes on your laptop from that directory and publish your change and have it merged upstream. And everyone's happy, and you never have to change the import path. So combine this with GoDep or with any vendoring tool, and we can commit our changes and then vendor them and then deploy them before our changes are merged upstream or before we've even published them. We can push our code to a continuous integration server or have a new coworker clone our project and it'll just work, even while our patch is still unmerged. And of course, there's no cleanup because we've been using the original import path all along. So when that patch does get merged, we can just continue on and not have to worry about changing anything. There is one slight drawback from this method and that's that no one knows where your commit ID, where this new commit that you've committed is, um, if all they have is your own package. In the future, GoDep might record an alternate Git URL in cases like this so that people just know where to find your fork. Okay, finally, let's talk about import path rewriting. The basic dilemma is, 
GoGet, on the one hand, we know that letting our users install a command with GoGet is a pretty solid thing to do. And on the other hand, we know that making packages reproducible using vendoring is most excellent. Um, but if we could do both at the same time, that would be okay, I guess. So this is, this is how we can do it in GoDep. GoDep save minus R. It's a relatively new flag. And what it does is, it does the same thing that it normally does, copies all of the source code into your project, but then it also goes through and re rewrites all of the import statements so that instead of referring to the original location, they refer to the new location in our own repo. This makes our project suddenly self-contained. It actually has no external dependencies. They've all been turned into internal dependencies just with a weird import path. So I'd like to ask you to try it out uh, if you haven't already. Just, just run it once and, and see how you like it. And uh, if we as maintainers do a little extra work and GoDep does the heavy lifting, it means the people who are using our command can run go get and they'll end up with exactly the code we tested. And they won't have to install GoDep or even know what it is. And there will be puppies and rainbows and ice cream and they'll live in a happily ever after in a beautiful dependency utopia. Thank you.